those of us who do stand firmly with the Bible are constantly asked to defend such a position from its philosophical base, as if it were an outrageous, outlandish, and completely unbelievable point of view in light of the modern world's vast materialistic knowledge. Assaults on Scripture and its authority, however, are all too often born well, that is, accepted as reasonable, in a turning of proper values on their head, analogous to the Corinthian rejection of Paul's inspiration and authority, 2 Corinthians 11.20. And just as the Corinthians were more responsive to those who treated them poorly, 2 Corinthians 11.20, compare their response to Paul's reluctant use of harsher methods, 2 Corinthians 7.8-16. So in our own era, those seeking something more than lukewarmness are often drawn in by hyper-authoritative false teachers and cults, who likewise enslave, exploit, take advantage, push, slap in the face, 2 Corinthians 11.20. This sad state of affairs is the result of a failure by both leaders and followers, by clergy and lay. For in general terms, our Laodicean era has seen for the most part rank-and-file Christians not respecting the authority of teachers and leaders as they should, and teachers and leaders not being worthy of their respect in the first place. The instances where both ends of this essential equation have been adequately fulfilled have been few and far between. What has been lacking from all parties is true commitment, true dedication, a true willingness to sacrifice and strive for what we claim with our lips is the most important thing in our lives, our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ, to learn to be like Him and to truly follow Him, joining fully in the ministry to which He calls us, and we are all called to something. In our defense, it is possible to say that the satanic attack upon the fire of Christian zeal in our era has been incredibly subtle and effective. Rather than a direct assault upon our existence, values and standards, the adversary has instead been playing a game of innovation since the beginning of the 19th century, seeking the gradual atrophy of fervent spirituality and unreserved faith rather than blatant apostasy, a perfect preparation for just such an apostasy which will indeed break forth during the tribulation's first half. One can trace this tactic through all areas of human life and society during the Laodicean era. Whether it be Darwinism and scientific relativism, that is, what truth there is must be sought in the material realm, psychoanalysis, that is, human rather than divine means of problem-solving, or the growing scholarly skepticism about the Bible, that is, higher criticism and others, myriad modern societal trends have as their practical effect the diminution of faith. And this attack has been two-pronged. For not only have we been resoundingly and continually told by the pillars of the scientific and scholarly community that our faith has been misplaced, but we have also been tempted by the offering up of science and technology as a substitute for God's truth. Ideally, we who believe in God ought to be able to avail ourselves of whatever is at hand in our day for personal sustenance and the prosecution of our individual ministries, provided we do so in a sanctified way, without at the same time trusting in these worldly media, as if they were the means of that sustenance. Every truly good thing we have comes from God, James 1.17. But every time we are led to rely on the things of this world instead of upon Him, our faith is undermined, and it has certainly been a trend of the modern age that the development, expansion and exaltation of scientific, material and technological means has led to a corresponding rise in their valuation in our collective thinking, a trend against which believers need to guard themselves carefully. On the science and technology side of things, this is particularly evident in the realm of medicine, where Satan uses the latent fear of death so universally human as a powerful hammer to blunt the believer's faith by encouraging a reliance upon the healing arts to the neglect of God when bodily troubles arise. Hebrews 2.15 on the academic side, the subtle corruption of simple faith in the truth of Scripture can be clearly seen from late 19th and 20th century trends in the scholarly treatment of the Bible. Source criticism, form criticism, redaction criticism, archaeological revisionism, scientific attacks on the accuracy of the Bible, the quest for the historical Jesus, attempts to isolate the true kerygma of the Gospels, demythologization, etc., all represent a self-indulgent, self-glorifying, so-called search for the truth of the Scripture in word, 
but indeed are dedicated to destroying it out of pride and envy for its true power. We have in just a few short generations come to the place that great institutions of learning, expressly founded to teach and understand the Bible, are now only interested in its refutation, to the extent that they are concerned about it at all. The fact that Laodicea is also the only one of the seven church eras where there is no external or internal opposition mentioned, besides dead Sardis, where the true believers are forced to withdraw entirely, means that by the time of our era, the leaven of complacency has so thoroughly permeated our collective thinking that it is scarcely possible to make a distinction any more between right and wrong, at least as far as the teachings of the various visible church organizations are concerned. The result is a situation where instead of opposing groups expressing sharp points of view, we find one largely homogeneous collection of groups, differing only in the superficialities of appearance, which is neither hot nor cold. The effectiveness of this satanic strategy of relativism is clear. For instead of posing a direct challenge to the truth, the compromise of faith brought on by the progression of prosperity, laziness, loose standards, and apathy about the Word of God has gradually rendered the church of our era, taken collectively, a largely insipid, superficial, vapid, and lukewarm institution. In terms of our dedication to the Word of God, the person and the teachings of Jesus Christ, this easy listening Christianity, as we may characterize it, has essentially reduced the vigor of a great symphony performed live to recorded elevator music playing in the background. It may be recognizable as music on some level, but it is not the same thing, not the real thing. In just this same way, our Christianity has all too often become something merely gratuitous and incidental for the purpose of light entertainment, rather than something to be treasured, respected, and given our full attention. The entertainment portion of this equation is one upon which we should reflect for a moment. In all serious undertakings, it is very easy for an element of entertainment, ostensibly employed to gain attention, to become the end as well as the means. It may well be asked if the God of our salvation and the sacrifice of His Son are not sufficient in themselves to gain our attention, then to what end entertainment? But pleasant and pleasurable distractions are virtually the only thing left in much of what passes for Christianity in our day. For lukewarm Christians, fun-filled services of little or no true spiritual content seem a perfect way to enjoyably cover the base of their responsibility to God. This comes close to being the very definition of the lukewarmness for which Christ indicts us in these verses. This trend to lukewarmness in all of its aspects, science over faith, materialism over spirituality, glossy appearance over inner reality, quantity, celebrity, and enjoyment over quality, true substance and sacrifice, has the effect of rendering us all the more vulnerable to the great apostasy predicted during the tribulation's first half, which is all too soon to come. Christ's self-description. This is what the Amen says, the reliable and truthful witness, the origin of God's creation. All of these elements in Christ's description of himself to us speak to the authoritative nature of his words. That is to say, contrary to the entire fundamental attitude of our era, we are not that font of truth and authority. Rather, it is Jesus Christ who, as the head of the church, is the ultimate and the only true source of truth, our ultimate and our only true authority. 1 Corinthians 11.3 and Ephesians 1.22 The Amen As the Amen, Jesus is the truth, John 14.6, and the one who ratifies and declares truth. The word Amen, a Greek transliteration from the Hebrew, means in truth or truly. Therefore, as a title for our Lord, it clearly underscores the fact that He not only truthfully represents the truth, but that He is the truth. This is an important attention-getter for the constituents of a church era, who make it plain by our actions and our words that we believe it is we who have all the answers. The folly of establishing one's own standards, then judging oneself favorably by such self-developed standards, is patently obvious and incredibly arrogant, and is declared to be so by the Scriptures, 2 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13. The only correct and proper standard of faith and practice for Christians is the Bible, the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Logos, 
the word of God, John 1, 1 and 2, 